OK, for the sake of time, I think we are going to get started. Uh, Rachel, uh, who's moderating the chat, will continue to allow uh, people to enter. Uh, again, this is going to be recorded for future viewing. Uh, that being said, uh, my name is Eric Gonzalez. I am a health promoter within the Family Health Division here in Niagara. Welcome to the Niagara Region Public Health Rounds, focus on maternal mental health and adverse childhood experiences. Um, a quick note before we begin, uh, you'll notice that your um, video and chat are disabled. You may ask any questions or make any comments uh, within the chat, uh, but we do recommend using the Q&A feature if that's available to you. We will be attempting to answer any questions that may arise throughout the session at the end during our dedicated Q&A uh, portion. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the land on which we are hosting this session. Niagara Region is situated on treaty land. This land is steeped in the rich history of the First Nations people, which includes the Hadiwendorong, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe, including the Mississaugas of the Credit Nation. There are many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit from across Turtle Island that live and work in Niagara today. The regional municipality of Niagara stands with all Indigenous peoples, past and present, in promoting the wise stewardship of the lands on which we live. Next, I just want to make a disclosure of financial support. This program is hosted and organized by Niagara Region Public Health. I am a paid employee with Niagara Region Public Health. In consideration for conflict of interest, Niagara Region Public Health receives funding from the province of Ontario, who also supports funding for public health research programs and resources that may be discussed today. Mitigating potential bias, all data, resources, and recommendations presented are based on current scientific literature and data. Moving along, I'll briefly go over today's agenda. We'll be starting uh, by setting the context. Dr. Kasmani will be going over uh, local data, followed by participant polling. Next, we will move on to our keynote speakers, Dr. Ryan Van Leeshout and Dr. Chris Kowski. I will quickly go over Niagara Parents and some of our uh, public health programming. Then we will move on to questions and answers before we wrap up and uh, move on to our evaluation. Without further ado, I'd like to pass it off to Dr. Kazbani. Medical Officer of Health at Niagara Region Public Health. Great, uh, thanks Eric, uh, and thank you and the team for putting on this event. It's great to see so many people online here today uh, and looking through the names, uh, so many colleagues um, <clears throat> locally in Niagara and seeing some uh, from beyond as well. So thanks for joining us. And it's always a little intimidating when you're speaking to a, a group of such uh, renowned colleagues, but uh, um, uh, I'll start off by just giving a little bit of an introduction to some of the epidemiology um, and uh, then we'll pass it off to uh, who you're really here to see our guest speakers today. Uh, so the burden of uh, mental illness in Canada is quite significant. And just I'll apologize if you hear some noise in the background. We do have a couple little ones uh, and they're waiting for dinner downstairs. So I uh, apologize for any background noise. Um, but <clears throat> the burden of mental illness in Canada is significant. Uh, and in the last 10 years, we're noticing or we've noted that the prevalence of mood and anxiety disorders has actually increased significantly. Uh, in 2022, more than 5 million people in Canada met the diagnostic criteria for a mood, anxiety, or substance use disorder. And one of our uh, one significant concern associated with this increase um, in mental health needs is a lack 
of programming and services to support individuals who have a diagnosis. Uh, and it's actually been noted that of those with a mood, anxiety, or substance use disorder, uh, more than a third of them, almost uh, almost 37%, actually reported unmet or partially met uh, health, um, health and mental health uh, care needs. So quite a significant gap uh, in service availability. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of maternal mental health, uh, we can also see that maternal mental health challenges uh, impact a particularly vulnerable population that's new or expectant mothers in the perinatal period, defined as uh, the time from onset of pregnancy until a year after giving birth. Uh, while most um, mothers may experience some fluctuation in mood or affect during the perinatal period, often referred to as the baby blues, uh, some actually experience much more significant impairment to their mental health uh, during that period. In 2019, approximately uh, one in four, 23% of uh, Canadian mothers who recently gave birth actually reported feelings consistent uh, with postpartum uh, depression or an anxiety disorder. Um, and postpartum depression is a mental health challenge uh, where we see intense feelings of worry, sadness, uh, and they significantly impact the function and quality of life uh, of the individual experiencing those symptoms. Um, and mothers are more at risk if they previously experienced a mental health challenge. Uh, of those who reported postpartum depression and anxiety, um, about a third or 31 percent had actually been previously told by a healthcare professional that they had a mood disorder uh, prior to pregnancy. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> we'll briefly take a look next at the uh, mental health of parents here in the Niagara region. Um, but just one way we support parents in the region uh, through uh, is through our Niagara Parents Access Line. Uh, this is a service that allows really anyone in uh, the uh, who has the care of a child. So parents, grandparents, teachers, guardians, uh, that allows them an opportunity to connect with a public health nurse on a range of topics. And we record thousands of encounters with parents and caregivers through this service annually. Actually in 2022, uh, parental mental health was the second highest recorded topic discussed through the Niagara Parents virtual and telephone service lines followed by, uh, or sorry, just preceded by uh, breastfeeding. Um, and so in Niagara, actually, we're quite successful in that over 90% of new infants are screened uh, using the Healthy Babies, Healthy Children screening tool. And that's a tool that uh, we routinely use to identify uh, families who uh, may be at risk uh, and who may benefit from the uh, Healthy Babies, Healthy Children home visiting program uh, during the prenatal, postnatal and early childhood periods. And uh, we actually identified from these screens that uh, 40, just over 40% of completed uh, postpartum HBHC screens indicated that clients or actually parenting partners have a history of depression, anxiety, or un other mental illness. So uh, quite a significant burden here locally as well. Um, and we also looked at uh, the Public Health Ontario snapshot data for Niagara specifically. And among residents in Niagara, we actually found that 13% um, of, of parents who gave birth reported a mental health concern during pregnancy, including anxiety, depression, postpartum depression, addiction, bipolar disorder, or schizophrenia. Um, almost 10% uh, reported anxiety during pregnancy and over 5% reported depression during pregnancy. Next slide. Um, and why is this important? Why are considerations of mental, maternal mental health, uh, postpartum anxiety and depression uh, important? Because they are actually a risk factor for both the parent uh, and the child. And our keynote speakers today uh, will go into much more detail about this. Uh, but just in short, the quality of that infant um, uh, mother attachment is associated with social and social and emotional development in children. Uh, and we can see that the symptoms of anxiety and depression during that perinatal period uh, can affect how emotionally responsive and attuned a parent is uh, to their child's needs. Um, and so it's just also important to note that social and emotional development is something uh, that public health units uh, actively measure using the early develop uh, instrument tool. So what is the early development uh, instrument tool? Uh, it's actually a, a 
103 item questionnaire and it's completed by kindergarten teachers to measure uh, the children's ability to meet age appropriate development expectations within five domains. The domains are listed there. Um, once the data is collected, the data synthesized and reported is the proportion of children who are considered to be vulnerable within a specific domain. And vulnerability describes the percent of children who score below the 10th percentile cutoff of the Ontario baseline population. Uh, and children who may have special needs are reported on separately, and they're not counted in this sample. Uh, so here we can see a comparison um, of child vulnerability scores on social competence and emotional maturity, with uh, Ontario being in the green uh, and Niagara region being uh, in the blue. And this is from 2018. Uh, and we see that um, on both of those domains um, of uh, social competence and emotional maturity, the vulnerability score is higher in Niagara compared to uh, the provincial baseline, uh, where we see 11.7% of children are vulnerable uh, in the social competence uh, compared to 99 .9, uh, in Ontario, uh, and 13.4% of children in Niagara are vulnerable in the emotional maturity domain compared to 113 uh, as the provincial baseline. Uh, and so what could be contributing to this vulnerability within these domains uh, in Niagara? Um, increasingly, we see that the, uh, uh, I guess the short answer is it's usually uh, almost always connected back to social determinants of health. Uh, and what we see is that we're increasingly, we're seeing the identification of risk factors for the child's environment uh, showing a point of interest. Um, and research suggests that uh, some of those early childhood exposures um, and uh, have long lasting uh, implications throughout the lifespan. And adverse childhood experiences or ACEs are one such example. They're stressful or traumatic events that occur uh, during childhood and they increase the risk for um, harmful behaviors, poor physical and as well as poor physical and mental health outcomes. Um, and within here, we see that uh, a caregiver with mental illness, uh, such as postpartum depression, can actually uh, impact the development of a child. And our keynote speakers are going to uh, elaborate on this uh, further. So traditionally, we see that um, uh, the adverse childhood uh, experiences are grouped into three categories with abuse, neglect and household challenges. Uh, and we would see this fall into uh, household challenges. Um, so the research on adverse childhood experiences is quite robust. There's strong evidence demonstrating how exposure to more than one um, adverse childhood experience can actually significantly imp increase an individual's risk for negative health outcomes over the lifespan. And maternal mental health is a known risk factor um, and it's a modifiable risk factor that we can address with the right supports. So ACEs are in fact common. Uh, we've seen this study replicated across multiple settings as well. Um, in this original study, is, or in this recent study in 2019, we saw that uh, almost two thirds of participants reported at least uh, one adverse childhood experience. Uh, and in fact, 20%, around 20% reported experiencing three or more. Um, and then the risk for poor health outcomes actually increases with each additional exposure to a unique uh, adverse childhood experience. Uh, and social determinants of health actually exacerbate the impact of ACEs. And if we go back and look at the different ones, you'll see how they're connected. Uh, and here, just on the next slide, we can see some of the lasting health impacts that are associated with adverse childhood um, experiences, uh, so those childhood experiences and the adult um, lasting health impacts, increased risk for mood disorders such as anxiety or depression being there, but as well as physical um, impacts like uh, cancer, diabetes, um, and so on uh, and so forth. Um, the Canadian Pediatric Society recently released a position statement on uh, relational health approach uh, as a strategy to address adverse childhood uh, experiences. And this position statement is a call to action for physicians, uh, helping to respond to the increasing concern around adverse childhood experience risk factors, uh, including uh, maternal depression. Uh, so on the next slide, the recommendations for clinical practice um, are really the area we're going to focus on. 
uh, to screen, assess, and refer our clients or patients who meet the clinical definition of postpartum depression. Uh, and I'll pass it back to Eric to introduce our keynote speakers who will uh, speak uh, to this more. Justin, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Kazmani. I will now pass it off to our keynote speakers. First, I'll be welcoming Dr. Uh, Ryan Van Lee Schout. Thanks, Eric. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for having, thanks for having me, and and thanks for having my colleague John Kraskowski. Um, today we're going to talk to you about perinatal depression, a very common adverse childhood experience, and and one that we're excited that we can do something about. And um, I've got a lot of fancy titles, but I'm at McMaster University, where I'm a perinatal psychiatrist, and um, my work is aimed at trying to uh, disrupt the intergenerational transmission of psychopathology from from uh, parents to to their children. Um, so if we can go to the next next slide, please. Um, neither John nor I have any relationships with financial sponsors to disclose. So we can move right along. So today we're going to talk a bit about the prevalence and scope of perinatal depression. And then we're going to talk about the impact that it can have on mothers, birthing parents, and offspring. Um, then we're going to take a bit of a clinical approach to looking at the detection, diagnosis, and management of, of perinatal depression. So uh, the clinical aspects of today's talk are, are covered extensively in this, this review paper that a, a junior colleague and I wrote that's published in the Journal of the American Board of Family Medicine. Um, so if you're interested in uh, the real nitty gritty of, of the, the clinical things that, that I'll be talking about today, um, you know, you're welcome to, to take a look at, at, that, uh, at that paper. So perinatal depression is, is something that, that um, is very important, and and John and I have have de devoted a lot of our careers uh, to. So often defined as depression occurring in the first uh, postpartum during pregnancy in the first postpartum year, most cases of 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 perinatal depression occur during pregnancy and in the the first three months postpartum. People can develop depression after the first three months postpartum, uh, and it's often referred to as postpartum depression. But most of the cases are in the new onset case in the first three months. It's also important to note that that while about 7% of, of, of mothers will develop full-blown major depressive episodes uh, during pregnancy and in the first postpartum year, um, up to 30% will experience elevated levels of symptoms of depression. And these individuals are important because uh, they often have outcomes themselves and in their families that are indistinguishable from those who meet full diagnostic criteria for a major depressive episode. These individuals are also at higher risk for not being treated because they don't meet diagnostic thresholds and so they're an important group to think about as well. So perinatal depression is associated with a number of adverse outcomes for mothers, birthing parents, offspring and other family members um, and uh, and now we're gonna John I'm gonna hand it over to John to to talk about to talk about those. Um, John is this your next slide? Yeah this is uh, Rachel we can move uh, for the perfect. Uh, Thanks, Ryan. So uh, as was mentioned, adverse childhood experiences uh, have a powerful and enduring effect on, on child development, and they can be broken down into two categories in terms of their effects on child development. The first is experiencing or witnessing traumatic events like violence and abuse. Uh, and then the second is essentially environmental factors, which you can move forward a bit. Sorry, I've got everything coming in to, to increase suspense, but um, we've got environmental conditions that significantly disrupt child stability, safety, and bonding. And so we know that postpartum depression uh, is associated with poorer academic performance uh, and behavior problems in childhood but is also linked with elevated risk of psychiatric disorders uh, in adulthood. So we can move to the next slide now. But we know that postpartum depression or its impact on offspring can be detected as early as infancy. And one of the things that we're most concerned about in terms of its effect on infancy is its disruption on infant emotion regulation. So emotion regulation is defined as the ability to modify emotions in the service of future goals. 
So we know that postpartum depression has an adverse effect on emotion regulation in infants and young children. And this is really important because emotion regulation problems measured very early in life, even in infancy, are also associated with academic and behavior problems in childhood and even increased risk for psychiatric disorders in adulthood. So how actually does postpartum depression exposure impact infant emotion regulation? We can go to the next slide. So we know that emotion regulation develops through mother-infant interactions. And if we look at interactions in healthy mother-infant pairs, they're characterized by a consistent matching and mismatching of mother-infant emotions and behaviors. But it's through these moments where the mismatches are repaired and become matches, where infants learn that negative states can actually be repaired and overcome. And over the course of time, these reparations from a mismatch to a match shape emotion regulation brain regions. Now, if we look at these same interactions in mother-infant pairs affected by postpartum depression, they're characterized by longer and more enduring moments of mismatch and fewer opportunities to repair the interaction. And what happens here is that infants learn that these negative states are enduring, and this actually disrupts emotion regulation brain development. Go to the next slide. So we know that treating postpartum depression can reduce PPD symptoms in mothers, improve mood and improve bonding. We also know that infant emotion regulation development is very sensitive to maternal emotions and behaviors. So this provides us with a really tremendous opportunity whereby treating postpartum depression may be able to reduce risk for development of these emotion regulation problems and then reduce the subsequent risk of adverse outcomes later in life. So I'm gonna investigate the question, can treating postpartum depression improve infant emotion regulation? And I'll do this through presenting data from three studies. So in study one, we investigated whether treating postpartum depression with group cognitive behavioral therapy delivered in a specialized perinatal psychiatric clinic can improve infant emotion regulation. Then in study two, we were interested in whether CBT, but this time delivered by people who have had and subsequently recovered from postpartum depression, uh, whether treatment delivered by these peers uh, improves infant emotion regulation. And then finally, we were interested in looking at whether CBT delivered by public health nurses, these were Niagara region public health nurses, uh, whether uh, this treatment improves infant emotion regulation. So I'm gonna start by talking about how we actually assess emotion regulation in a preverbal infant. And there's multiple ways to do this, but two of the most effective are looking at these physiological measures, which essentially assess the foundations of emotion regulation very early in life. So the first one I'm gonna describe is something called frontal EEG asymmetry. And simply put, greater relative activity in the left frontal hemisphere uh, is associated with better emotion regulation. Conversely, greater right frontal EEG asymmetry or greater activity in the right frontal hemisphere is associated with poor emotion regulation. Another system that we look at is something called heart rate variability. So interestingly, the brain-based regions involved in emotion regulation also play a role in mediating the beat to beat intervals of the heart. And simply put, uh, higher heart rate variability is linked to better emotion regulation. Interestingly, exposure to ACEs, including postpartum depression, is consistently linked to greater right frontal EEG asymmetry and lower heart rate variability in infancy, childhood, and across the lifespan. We can there we go. Uh, so in study one, these were this was CBT delivered by specialists. We recruited uh, mother-infant pairs affected by postpartum depression and matched them on infant age, infant sex, and family socioeconomic status uh, to mother-infant pairs uh, not affected by depression. And we looked at both groups at two time points. So in the dyads affected by depression, we looked at the infants before and after the moms received nine weeks of group cognitive behavioral therapy. And in the controls, we looked at the infants at a baseline condition and then nine weeks later. So let's take a look at the results in our next slide here. 
So in blue, we have the babies of moms with postpartum depression, and in orange, we have the control babies. So let's take a look at what happened with frontal EEG asymmetry. So at visit one here, not surprisingly, we see that the babies of moms with postpartum depression have greater right frontal EEG asymmetry, indicative of poorer emotion regulation. But let's take a look at what happened after treatment. And what we see is a significant shift in the frontal asymmetry from showing greater right frontal asymmetry to greater left frontal asymmetry in the babies of moms after they receive treatment. And at visit two, the babies of moms with postpartum depression were no different than the healthy control babies. And there was no change from uh, visit one to visit two in the controls. So we were quite excited about these findings and wanted to see if we could uh, replicate them in another measure in heart rate variability. And so at visit one, again, we're seeing that the babies of moms with postpartum depression exhibited significantly lower heart rate variability, indicative of poor emotion regulation. But let's see what happened after nine weeks of maternal CBT treatment. We see a significant increase in the heart rate variability only in the babies of moms that received treatment for postpartum depression. There was no change from visit one to visit two in the controls. And at visit two, the babies of moms with postpartum depression were indistinguishable from the healthy control baby. So indistinguishable after their mothers received treatment. We also have evidence suggesting that these improvements were retained even three months following the end of treatment. So we were pretty encouraged about these findings, but wanted to see if we could replicate them in other study designs. So we can go forward to see those. So in studies two and three, uh, we conducted what's called a randomized control trial where we recruited moms and babies with postpartum depression, and we randomly assigned them to receive uh, treatment uh, or waitlist control groups. And so in both groups, we again looked at the infants at two time points. So in the treatment group, this was uh, before and after uh, treatment delivered by peers. These were uh, individuals with postpartum depression subsequently recovered from postpartum depression and then trained to deliver treatment. And then in study three, we'll present data on treatment delivered by nurses. And in the waitlist control group, we looked at the infants at baseline and nine weeks later. So first I'm gonna present the results from the peer study. Um, we can jump forward, Rachel, thanks. Uh, so again, in blue, we have the treatment group babies and in orange, we have the waitlist control babies. So let's take a look at what we found with frontal EEG asymmetry. So again, we're seeing a significant shift from greater right to greater left frontal EEG asymmetry only in the babies of mothers that receive nine weeks of cognitive behavioral therapy delivered by peers. There was no significant difference in the waitlist control group between the two time points. Now let's take a look at what we observed for heart rate variability. And again, we're seeing a significant increase in heart rate variability only in the babies of mothers that received treatment. There was no difference in the heart rate variability in the waitlist control babies. So now let's take a look at the uh, results from the Niagara Region study. So these, this was the study um, where we delivered CBT uh, using uh, or, or nurses uh, were trained to deliver CBT. So again, we have in blue uh, the treatment babies and in orange, we have the waitlist control babies. So this time for frontal EEG asymmetry, we didn't see any differences between the two groups. However, if we looked at the heart rate variability, uh, we see a significant increase in the babies of moms that receive treatment uh, from visit one to visit two and no difference in the waitlist control babies. So given this evidence, uh, we were interested in investigating potentially what contributes to these changes. And one of the things that we were interested in looking at was uh, mother-infant interactions and how these may be changing following treatment. Uh, so we know that mother's influence on infant emotion regulation is very important, particularly when the infants are experiencing moments of distress. So this is moments when infants are signaling for safety, protection, and comfort. And so a task that we uh, do to assess uh, mother-infant interactions during moments of distress is called the still face paradigm. Um, so if you want to click one more, Rachel, we'll get the still face paradigm there. 
maybe once more. There we go. Uh, so it's a task that's carried out in three phases. So in first is the a play phase where the mother and the infant are seated facing each other and are tasked with interacting as they normally would. And here's where we'd see the, 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 the characteristic matching and mismatching of emotions and behavior. Then what happens is for two minutes, the mother is signaled to adopt a completely neutral still face. She's, not, she's instructed not to respond to any of her infant cues uh, and, and, and while maintaining eye contact with her infant. And what happens here is we essentially create a, a, a big mismatch in the interaction where the infant's emotions and behaviors are not being picked up by the mother, the mother's not responding, and this leads to distress in the infant. And then finally, after the two minute still face phase is the reunion phase. Now this is the really important moment of the task where we're measuring mother-infant interactions in the context of infant distress. So mothers tasked with helping their infant regulate after this big mismatch period caused by the still phase. So during the reunion phase, mothers must effectively regulate their own emotions and then respond effectively to infant cues to enable the infants to regulate their emotions. So we can jump to the next slide. So using data from the public health nurse CBT study, we investigated if postpartum depression treatment improves how mothers regulate their infant's distress to repair the interaction. Uh, so what we did here was we looked at the reunion phase and we looked at mother heart rate variability, which is a measure of her emotion regulation over the first half of the reunion phase. And we wanted to know if this predicted the infant's heart rate variability, so infant emotion regulation, over the course of the final half of the reunion phase. And what we were looking for was potentially a mother to infant heart rate variability influence effect to examine whether this may be a mechanism through which mothers are regulating their infant's distress or helping transfer emotion regulation from themselves to their infants in a sense. So if we jump to the next slide, we can see what we found here. So interestingly, at visit one, um, we did not see any mother to infant influence effects in the treatment group and the waitlist control group. So these are mothers with postpartum depression randomized to receive treatment or waitlist control. And here we don't see any effect of mothers and infants. Now in visit two, what we see here, and one more, one more time, Rachel. Perfect, uh, oops, too much. So at visit two, we see that only in the treatment group, we see that mother's heart rate variability, so mother's emotion regulation, predicted infant's emotion regulation uh, during the course of the reunion phase. So this is potentially indicative of mother's improved ability to regulate their own emotions, effectively read infant cues, and then help support their infant through, through this moment of distress. We can go to the next slide now. So in summary, using three different treatments with three different samples, we have evidence suggesting that treating postpartum depression appears to have positive effects on infant emotion regulation development. Our evidence also suggests that mothers may be coming better at regulating their own emotions and reading infant cues to help support their infants and navigate them through moments of distress. So treating postpartum depression potentially interrupts the intergenerational transmission of risk by improving infant emotion regulation, and this may decrease the risk of later cognitive and behavior problems in offspring. So this further underscores the importance of screening for and treating postpartum depression, given its critical health benefits, not only for mothers, uh, but for her infants as well. And I'll pass it on to Dr. Van Leeshout to, to continue the rest of the talk. Thanks very much, John. And I just wanted to make a comment. I mean, the, the, the slides that John just presented um, comprised his, his PhD thesis that he did. And, and you know, that, that work was done in collaboration with Niagara Region Public Health. I had to look back in my emails to see how long ago it was that um, I started working with, with NRPH. And uh, it was 2014, I had my first contact with a public health nurse here. And they've been such fantastic partners in developing this this sort of nine-week CBT um, for perinatal depression program. 
um, you know, they were the they were the first in the province to 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 do it. Um, they've been provincial leaders, not only in delivering it, but they've also been instrumental in in helping to scale this program across the province. Um, always, you know, stepping up when other public health units needed to be trained, and and it's just been uh, been an amazing partnership. So, um, and and no, I didn't get paid to say that. So, um, so it's been a wonderful, wonderful partnership, and and we're so happy to have had it, and and just so exciting to show that their investment in training the nurses to deliver this program not only helps the mothers and birthing parents, but can have uh, positive effects on, on the offspring as well. So we'll move over now to, to some, more, some more of the, the, the maternally focused sort of issues. Um, and we're first going to talk about screening for perinatal depression and whether we should do that or not. And there's been a lot of debate about this in uh, in Canada. There was a, a, a recommendation last year by a Canadian group that that instrument-based uh, screening was um, was not recommended. And and that that recommendation sort of flies in the face of of recommendations from around the world, including the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, which did recommend screening for depression in pregnant and postpartum persons. Um, and so. Um, I think that th this this has sort of been the world leading guidance and and most settings um, follow it. So we should screen for postpartum depression probably for a variety of reasons, not the least of which uh, is that a single cost a single case of of perinatal depression costs one hundred and fifty thousand dollars over the lifespan, and two thirds of those costs are associated with um, adverse uh, um, outcomes in offspring. Another problem is that that just despite the fact that that up to sort of one in in five uh, mothers will develop a perinatal uh, depression, just one in ten of these individuals can actually get access to evidence-based care. Um, and in Niagara, that can be di that is different because of the availability of the programming they've developed. Uh, to the next slide, please. So there's lots of different ways to screen for perinatal depression. The most popular way is to use the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale, the EPDS. Um, it's a free instrument that you can you can download from 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 the internet. It contains ten items, and uh, and these ten items tend to have more of an affective and cognitive focus. They they focus less on the physical symptoms um, because so many of those are present in normal pregnancy and and the postpartum period. And the, the cutoff that seems to have the best balance of sensitivity and specificity for detecting major depressive disorder is 11 or more. If you use 10 or more, it's a little bit more uh, sensitive. Use 13 or more, it's a little more specific, but 11 or more has the best balance. Now, in, in a lot of settings, a lot of family uh, practice settings, uh, the PHQ-9 is used, um, and that's fine too. And the cutoff for that scale is 10 or more if you're inclined to use that or if your organization uses that. Uh, both are, 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 are good. So on to the next slide. So when we look at the EPDS, it's sort of, some people are wondering, they wonder like what, what, how severe is it in, the, in these different, different score ranges? And there aren't too many papers on this, but it suggests that seven to 13 probably is mild depression, 14 to 19 is moderate, and, and 19 to 30 is severe. And if you are using this to, to track people, a four point change is thought to be clinically significant. On to the next slide. So when should we, when might we screen during pregnancy in the postpartum period? And there isn't any evidence, any, any hard evidence um, for this, but um, the expert guidelines tend to suggest that if you're going to screen during pregnancy to screen once in the first trimester, maybe at the first visit, and then in the third trimester, close to the beginning of it, around 30 weeks. So the Australian and, and American Co College of Obstet Obstetricians and Gynecologists have suggested first visit and somewhere in the third trimester. In terms of the postpartum period, we know that there are a lot of false positives in the first couple of weeks. Um, so what the uh, American Academy of Family Physicians suggests is uh, one, two, four, and six months postpartum. Um, that's what they, they've suggested. Again, there's not a strong evidence base for this, but, but clinically this, this makes good sense. On to the next. Yeah, so uh, there's probably a square that will appear around this, uh, one of these things here. So what you want to do after you um, have screened someone is then you want to then you want to do a diagnostic evaluation to determine if they have major depressive disorder or not. On to the next slide. And so what you're looking for is someone to have five or more symptoms of of 
a major depressive episode. And in medical school, we learn this mnemonic M SIGI caps, and it helps you to, to remember all of the symptoms of a major depressive episode. So M, um, depressed mood, um, S is for sleep, increased or decreased, I is for interest, usually uh, less interest in things people used to find uh, enjoyable. Uh, G is guilt or hopelessness. E is energy, a reduction in that. C is concentration uh, and decision making. Um, A is appetite, up or down. Uh, P is psychomotor agitation or retardation, which is something we observe, we don't ask people about. And then the last S is suicide, suicidal ideation. So even thoughts about death qualify as that. So we need to have five or more of those symptoms, one of which has to be um, depressed mood or lack of interest in things people formerly found, found pleasurable. But in the perinatal period, depression can appear a little bit different. There's no special set of diagnostic criteria for it, but clinically we notice that people with, with perinatal depression may have um, less sadness and less anhedonia than at other, other depression at other times in people's lives, and there's less suicidality. However, there's much more anxiety, restlessness, and agitation, and there's a lot, a lot of difficulty with decision making. Formerly very confident uh, mothers will struggle with even the simplest decisions sometimes, and they'll talk about losing their confidence in themselves. Another feature that that affects up to 40% of people with with major depressive, uh, sorry, uh, major depressive episodes of peripartum onset are obsessional thoughts or intrusive thoughts. These are thoughts of harm coming to the infant, thoughts of the infant drowning or being suffocated or electrocuted or some other horrible thing. And these thoughts are not thoughts that the, not thoughts that the mothers uh, want to have, um, and they almost invariably are egodystonic, that is that they, they don't like those thoughts. But up to 40% of people will have those intrusive thoughts, and if we don't ask people about them, they often, often don't tell you. Let's move on to the next slide, Rachel. So after you've after you have screened and then determined whether they have a major depressive episode or not, then it's time to assess for severity because that in most clinical practice guidelines helps determine what treatment is most appropriate. Next slide, please. So there isn't a really great way to, to sort of determine severity. We, we had talked about some EPDS cutoffs before where 14 to 19 was probably moderate and 20 and above were severe, but in terms of uh, another way of defining it is that a, a mild major depressive episode sort of sounds like an oxymoron, mild major, but they have around five or six symptoms and the symptoms are distressing, but they're manageable and they're not significantly impacting their ability uh, to socialize and their ability to function as a parent. On the, on the other end of the spectrum, people who have severe major depressive uh, episode, uh, a sort of severe one, um, will have often seven, eight, or nine symptoms. The, the symptoms are extremely distressing and they're, they markedly interfere with their ability to function and carry out the duties of, of parenthood. Moderate cases are, are somewhere in between. On to the next slide. And so this is a, the way that the American uh, College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists guideline define mild, moderate, and severe. I, I provide this just to just to, to provide a different look at it. And so they, if you look at the top line of the green, yellow, and red boxes, they say depression screener score. So that could be the EPDS or the PHQ-9. So mild would be 10 to 14, uh, moderate 15 to 19, and, and, and greater than 19, so 20 or more would be considered severe. So for all of, all of the severity uh, levels, it's important to start treatment. But also uh, a note here too, they say to consider underlying medical conditions um, like anemia and thyroid disease. The most common ones will be um, hypothyroidism and iron deficiency anemia. This isn't uh, something you have to do for all patients. That's why they're suggesting that, you know, if it's clinically indicated, if you're seeing symptoms of hypothyroidism or iron deficiency anemia to, to test for those things. And I wouldn't say test for, for this in everyone because it's, it's, it's too costly. On to the next slide, please. So when I wrote the National Practice Guidelines um, a couple of years ago, uh, they agreed with, with some of the other guidelines that have been published subsequently. So the first line treatment for, for mild to moderate um, uh, postpartum or perinatal depression is um, cognitive behavioral therapy or interpersonal psychotherapy. Now, this is not available in all settings, 
but when it is, these are the first line treatments and they can be delivered online or in person by a therapist um, and they can be delivered individually or in groups. All of those are effective. Um, people haven't shown that that sort of coaching like bounce back uh, is as effective is as effective in this population yet, but it remains to be seen. Perhaps it will be. But for now, it's CBD or, I, or IPT uh, online or in person delivered by a therapist in individuals or groups. So the second line, which is on the next slide, and then second, sorry, the second line treatment for mild to moderate uh, major depressive episodes is uh, monotherapy with a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And just to note, this is the first line treatment for severe major depressive episodes. So we skip the, the IPT and CBT for severe episodes. So in terms of um, SSRI uh, monotherapy, um, it's been proven uh, effective in the postpartum period. There has never been a randomized control trial during pregnancy, and so this recommendation is based on extrapolation from non-pregnant people, which is a, a fair thing to do. On to the next slide. The, the SSRIs or the medications that we prefer most in, in the perinatal period are sertraline and escitalopram. Um, this is based on their effectiveness for treating major depression outside of the perinatal period and, and in the postpartum period. Um, for this specific population. Sertraline tends to get across the placenta and into the breast milk, the least of any of, um, of, any of the medications. So it's theoretically um, uh, preferred by, mo by most people. It, it has more GI side effects than escitalopram. Escitalopram gets across the placenta and into breast milk a little bit more, but is usually better tolerated by, um, by the mother or the, the parent-to-be. That doesn't mean that if someone um, is doing well on another medication that you necessarily switch to one of these agents because the differences between them in terms of um, in terms of um, teratogenesis or or uh, passage in breast milk or complications in that way uh, are are not large. These are the ones we pick first. And in 2016, when I wrote the guidelines, I, I had some spirited debates with the the people who oversaw the entire guideline about saying that uh, the medication that has worked for the the patient is the one that they should, has worked previously, is the one that they should use. Um, they they won that argument at that time, and now um, newer guidelines are agreeing with that. So just because sertraline and eustaloprem are preferred doesn't mean you necessarily have to switch to them if a patient's doing well on a current medication. On to the next slide, please. The less preferred SSRIs, if you're starting something, someone on something new, uh, include paroxetine and fluoxetine. So paroxetine, although it gets across the placenta very, very little, um, has been linked to more uh, cardiac malformations than the other SSRIs. Not a staggering number more, but still more. I have used paroxetine with pregnant people for whom it's the only medicine or, that worked or the one that worked the best after a discussion of the benefits and drawbacks of being on that medicine. Fluoxetine um, used to be the most commonly uh, used one. Um, now it suggests that maybe it has it's associated with a few more malformations and it has a longer half-life, so it can accumulate in breast milk a little bit more. We still have lots of patients um, taking it during pregnancy and the postpartum period, but if you're just starting someone on something new, um, we often sort of uh, pass on these ones and we'll try others. Uh, the next slide, please. So when we're thinking about um, decision, helping uh, patients with decision making about the risks and benefit of uh, antidepressant uh, treatment during uh, the perinatal period, we are always thinking about the risks of the medications, but also the risks of untreated illness. And John alluded to some of those, the latter risks, but I'll talk about them at the end of my slides as well. Let's go on to the next slide, please. So. Before we talk about the risks that are associated with um, antidepressant medicines during pregnancy, we have to talk about the significant limitations of the studies done to assess that. So most of, so all of the studies that have examined this have been observational studies. And these, most of these studies haven't adjusted for the confounders of associations between antidepressants and these adverse outcomes in fetuses and infants. What that means is there may be, character, there may be characteristics that are associated with antidepressant prescription and these adverse outcomes that, they aren't adjust, that aren't being adjusted for. So when we look at associations between antidepressants and adverse outcomes, sometimes we're actually just measuring the, the relationship between depression and adverse outcomes, or uh, pre-pregnancy obesity, or, or alcohol or tobacco use, or other substance misuse. And so even though most of the studies haven't adjusted for these confounders, the magnitude of the reported risks 
in studies of antidepressants um, taken during pregnancy are often quite small. And so the, the odds ratios for most of these risks, even when we look in, at really big um, uh, 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 registry studies as, as from the Scandinavian countries, the risks of uh, associated with these medicines, even you know, paroxetine and fluoxetine, are still about one and a half. And at an on a population level, those numbers are important, but at an individual level, um, odds ratios of less than two really aren't clinically meaningful because you need to have so many more exposures to get so many more people exposed to antidepressants to get a bad outcome. So the medications are largely safe, but I'm going to review the, the, the data for you now. You don't just have to take my word for it. On to the next slide, please. So one of the things that people are most worried about, mothers or, or parents to be pregnant people are most worried about, are congenital malformations. And so, of course, um, uh, organogenesis occurs during the first tri 12 weeks of pregnancy, the first trimester. And so what, what we see is that with first trimester SSRI use, the risk of any, any congenital malformation doesn't appear to be in increased relative to those who don't take antidepressants during the first trimester. And the risk of congenital of cardiac malformations is, is a little bit higher. But when we ex restrict our analyses to studies that um, look at pregnant individuals with a psychiatric diagnosis, we see no increased risk. So it it, what we think is that it may be the psychiatric diagnosis that increases the risk, not necessarily um, the medications. Let's go on to the next slide. Now we're going to talk about congenital malformations with first trimester SNRIU, so venlafaxine and duloxetine. So it looks like the risk of congenital malformations might be increased in this group. The studies where um, where we looked at pregnant um, individuals with a clinical indication for use, the risks weren't increased, but an emerging literature is starting to suggest that maybe venlafaxine is associated with more cardiac malformations, but the data are not so convincing that we necessarily suggest that people switch medications. On to the next one. So another, another, another issue that a lot of um, pregnant people are concerned about, obviously, is spontaneous abortion and stillbirth. And the risk of spontaneous uh, abortion does appear to be increased in people who take antidepressants during pregnancy, but most of the risk is concentrated with two agents, venlafaxine and fluoxetine. And these miscarriages usually occur in, in the, uh, are usually associated with first trimester use, even though the, the miscarriages can occur later. It is important, so uh, the, the risk for spontaneous abortion may actually be lower than um, untreated illness for sertraline, citalopram, citalopram, and paroxetine. And, and the red text at the bottom of the slide indicates that the risk of stillbirth with just having untreated depression is uh, on the same order of magnitude as, as with these higher risk medicines. But um, fluoxetine and venlafaxine are associated with a bit more spontaneous abortion and stillbirth. Preeclampsia. Uh, preeclampsia is a, so, um, uh, the risk of preeclampsia is slightly increased in those taking uh, SSRIs during pregnancy, but the risk is actually about the same as people with gestational depression. And since studies haven't adjusted for this, we're not sure if it's the medication or having uh, having depression. On to the next one. So low birth weight and preterm birth. So this is where. Um, a, a statistical significance is, is really a pain in the behind. So there is an increased risk of, uh, of lower birth weight in, in infants who are exposed to antidepressants or SSRIs during pregnancy, but this is on the order of 84 grams. So not clinically significant, but statistically significant. And same with preterm birth, although the risk is slightly increased, it's three, the, the risk of shortened, shortened gestation is it's three days earlier, just three days earlier. Um, and then again, the risk of low birth weight and preterm birth with people who have untreated depression uh, may actually be even higher than the risk in those who are taking medications. So one condition that, that, that people are understandably quite concerned about is persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, a significant uh, disorder of the lungs of infants. This is a serious complication of pregnancy and delivery. And we do know that, that PPHN uh, is, a, um, 
is increased in uh, in those who are taking SSRIs or um, SNRIs during pregnancy. So, but let's let's look past the relative risk, which is always kind of scary, and let's look at the absolute risks. The absolute risk of an infant um, unex of an infant unexposed antidepressants having PPHN is about two in in a thousand live births. It's very uncommon. And the risk of a uh, risk of PPHN in those exposed to SSRIs or SNRIs is 0 0.6 to three to three out of 1,000 live births. So it's only so it's only very slightly increased in an absolute sense, maybe one in a thousand. And so what what researchers have done is they've looked at okay, well the absolute risk is quite low. What's the number needed to harm? That's the one minus the absolute the absolute risk increase. And so we know that an extra 1,000 to 1,615 pregnant people have to be treated with an SSRI to get one extra case of persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. So absolutely massive numbers need to be treated. And so it's important when we look at when we look at these data to not only look at the at the relative risk, but to look at the absolute risk and these other metrics, because although PPHN is a serious complication. Um, it's not, it's very uncommon. And, and the studies that have been done to date suggest that sertraline and escitalopram probably have the, the lowest risk of all of the antidepressants, so more reasons why we, we recommend those as, as sort of first-line medicines. Rachel, can we go to the next one, please? So postpartum hemorrhage. So we know that, that um, SSRIs are associated with an increased risk of bleeding, right? This first was um, noticed in upper GI bleeds in older adults. Um, this is thought to be because, you know, um, uh, platelets, when they release serotonin, the SSRIs keep the serotonin from being reuptaken back into the platelets again. And because the platelets don't have a nucleus to make more, um, the platelets are less sticky. At least that, that's the theory that was going for a while. And so postpartum hemorrhage can be increased um, in those who take an, an SSRI, but the relative risk is just 1.2. So a very, very low risk on an individual level. We think that the risk with uh, with postpartum hemorrhage is higher with uh, SNRIs um, than SSRIs, but 1.6 times as opposed to 1.2. On to the next slide. So one of the one of the risks, um, and you know, so yeah, yeah. As you will have noticed in my first disclosure slide, I, I've never taken money from a, a drug company. I'm I'm being pretty pro treatment today. Um, most of my research is in psychotherapy. I'm, I'm a big fan of that, but I'm also someone who uh, sees a lot of patients and, and uh, does do a lot of prescribing of antidepressants for depression and anxiety and other indications. And I do so relatively confidently. Um, but one of the risks that we, we talk about with everyone when, when they're prescribed an SSRI is this poor neonatal adaptation syndrome. So we're not sure if this is a withdrawal syndrome or it's an overdrive syndrome, but we do know that between zero and 30% of neonates exposed to antidepressants in the third trimester will develop this neonatal adaptation syndrome. We're not sure if it's dose dependent or not. The data don't suggest that it is. It would make sense that it is, but but that's not been proven. But it's a, it's a sim syndrome of increased respiratory rate, increased heart rate, and jitteriness. The babies look like they're cold, they shiver, they're not cold, um, but they shiver and jitter, um, and it's it's very unpleasant to see. Uh, it, it exists on a spectrum. Uh, it usually lasts about two to three days and then resolves on its own, um, and there aren't, we don't think that there are any long-term effects of that. Research hasn't suggested uh, that there are. The, the, the higher risk um, medications are uh, two of them are, if, if you remember the ones that adult patients will have more withdrawal from when they stop them abruptly or miss them, venlafaxine and paroxetine, the infants have the same, the same risk. So neonatal adaptation syndrome is higher with those two medicines. And oddly enough, fluoxetine, which has the longest half-life, is also associated with more um, neonatal adaptation syndrome. And we're not sure why that is, but it, but it simply is. On to the next slide, please. So... Now that we've talked about pregnancy and we've talked briefly about um, the very early uh, postpartum period, now we're going to talk about the longer term risks. And the studies that have been done to date don't suggest that there is an increased risk of short or long term neurodevelopmental and neurobehavioral outcomes, adverse 
neurodevelopmental or neurobehavioral outcomes in offspring associated with antidepressant exposure. Several years ago, uh, a study was published that suggested that um, antidepressant exposure during pregnancy was associated with an increased risk of autism spectrum disorder. Um, those, th that study has been uh, refuted many, uh, many times. Um, and, and so we, we don't think that there are long-term risks associated with um, antidepressant exposure during pregnancy. Um, and, and research, although it's never been shown in a randomized control trial, observational research suggests that untreated depression may actually pose a greater risk um, than, than treated. On to the next one, please. And, and treated with an antidepressant. So on to lactation and antidepressant use. So the take home message, the message I hope you take home from this is that most of the newer antidepressants have a relative infant dose of less than 10%. And uh, the, uh, having a relative infant dose of less than 10% is, is sort of the, the yardstick for we think that it's safe. It doesn't mean that there can't be short-term adverse effects, but as long as less, the infant is getting less than 10% of the medicine, it's generally thought to be compatible with the breastfeeding. So sertraline gets into breast milk very little. Peroxetine is next least. Fluvoxamine, a medicine that, that it doesn't get used uh, a ton, it has some GI side effects, gets in very little, as do citalopram and escitalopram. So these are all great, but even, you know, all of them, uh, venlafaxine and SNRI, um, fluoxetine's been around for a long time, they all get into breast milk less than, than 10%. There's one medicine that, that one antidepressant, I should say, that we kind of that we generally avoid during lactation, and that's a, an older tricyclic antidepressant called doxepin. Um, it hadn't people hadn't talked about it for a while, but it has had a rebirth as a as a sleeping pill. So it's not advised that people uh, breastfeed on on doxepin because it can make the, the infant quite sleepy, quite somnolent. So here's some data. Um, there there you know. There are few, relatively few studies now um, on this, newer studies on this, because it, it, it's been relatively settled, I think. Um, so less than 1% of people who take sertraline will have, uh, and I will notice a short-term adverse effect in their infant, usually a coliciness or, or, um, or, um, or, or somnolence. Uh, peroxetine gets into breast milk very, very little as well, very low rates of, of uh, um, short-term adverse reactions. On to the next slide, please. Um, where we have citalopram, about 5% of infants will have um, colickiness or, or increased somnolence. Fluoxetine, about 4%. Same sorts, of, same sorts of things. And all of these adverse effects are reversible with either stopping the antidepressant or um, stopping breastfeeding. Um, Escitalopram, about 3% of babies will have some sort of reaction to it. Um, fluvoxamine, about 5% as well. It is important for me I, I, to also review, now that we've talked about the risks of, of taking um, antidepressants during uh, gestation, now we should discuss what are the risks of not being treated? You know, I, I have these conversations with patients and, and I say, well, we need to talk about the risks of, 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 of taking an antidepressant during pregnancy and lactation, but we also need to talk about the risks of untreated depression because this can also have adverse effects. I alluded to these in some of my earlier slides of the different um, gestational uh, adverse effects thought to be associated with antidepressants, but I've brought them all together here. So there is a, an increased risk of preterm birth and low birth weight uh, on the order of this, the same order of magnitude as with the antidepressants if they're not treated and they're depressed. Um, the risk of intrauterine growth, res growth restriction is quite high in people with untreated depression. Um, head growth is lower, body growth is slower. Uh, and there's a, a higher risk of having lower APGAR scores at delivery if someone's depressed and not treated. Um, other other uh, untreated, uh, other other uh, adverse effects of, of untreated depression, malnutrition is increased, infant physical illness is increased, the risk of having an infant hospitalized is increased with untreated depression, and um, rates of, of exclusive breastfeeding are decreased by 20 to 50 percent in those who have untreated uh, depression. We know that um, untreated depression in the first uh, first postpartum year is associated with a tripling of the of the risk of of um, emotional, behavioral, and even uh, school problems in infants. And so treatment is is very important. On to the next slide, please. 
people who have untreated depression are three times more likely to to mistreat their children. Uh, their partners are about one and a half times more likely to develop depression um, and offspring. As we extend out beyond childhood, um, the risk of their their offspring developing depression is is almost is almost doubled. It is also very important to treat to treat postpartum depression um, because it can persist. Uh, one quarter of postpartum depression cases will continue up to three years. And we know from the, the biggest antidepressant uh, randomized control trial done in history that if we treat maternal depression after, after pregnancy, um, it reduces the rates of offspring mental health problems um, for years afterwards. On to the next one. So a perinatal major depressive disorder is common. It affects 10% uh, or more of perinatal individuals. We can screen for it, it can be detected um, EPDS score of, uh, of 11 or more, PHQ-9 score of 10 or more, followed by a, a, a quick diagnostic assessment for major depression can enhance its detection. At-risk individuals um, with a mild to moderate major depressive disorder should be referred if possible to, to CBT or IPT, but only when available, um, in, which, in which case the, the medications become first line if it's not available. Those with uh, moderate to severe parental um, MDD should receive SSRI monotherapy. Um, these are the first line agents, but you don't have to switch your patients um, off uh, of something if it's been effective. Um, and a discussion of the, 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 the consequences of untreated depression um, and of treatments can help in conversations with patients about the benefits and harms of, of using these medicines perinatally. So thank you on behalf of uh, Dr. Kraskowski, thank you very much for uh, your attention today and for, for attending. And uh, yeah, thank you to Niagara Region for, uh, for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Van Lee Schout and Dr. Kraskowski, not only for the information you've provided here today, but for your research and for all the progress you've made in making uh, mental health access uh, more accessible. Uh, now, in my excitement to get to the keynote speakers, I actually uh, did not go over the polling questions. So I'd like to revisit those polling questions uh, if possible. It makes a little bit less sense now that you've all seen all the presentation. Uh, so uh, if we could pretend that you were receiving this prior to uh, the keynote speakers. Uh, please try to imagine yourself uh, before you had seen this information. Uh, the following questions uh, should be on screen. If you do not see them uh, pop up on your screen, you may have to uh, navigate towards the poll uh, section of the Microsoft Teams application. You should be able to see it there. Okay, I'm seeing some live entries to our poll here. So how often do you see people in the perinatal period who are experiencing mental health concerns? Currently, we have 38% not often, 25% sometimes, 25% often, 13% very often. How comfortable are you in asking people in the perinatal period about their mental health? Not comfortable, somewhat comfortable, uh, comfortable and very comfortable. 57% uh, for very comfortable, 43% for somewhat comfortable, zero for both non, not comfortable and comfortable. Do you feel confident in knowing where to refer someone experiencing mental health concerns in the perinatal period? 13% not confident, 50% somewhat confident, 25% confident, and 13% very confident. 
And are you aware of the Canadian Pediatric Society's position statement on early relational health? And we have a split tie here, 50% yes and 50% no. Okay, so very briefly, I just wanted to go over uh, some of our public health programming. Uh, Dr. Kosmani briefly mentioned uh, Niagara Parents, uh, but just as a reminder, uh, Niagara Parents is our uh, public facing access line where parents can get in contact with public with a public health nurse to discuss a number of uh, parenting topics. Next slide. And patients and clients may access Niagara Parents by phone, text, virtual chat, or email. Through our Niagara Parents uh, live chat service, we can actually offer support in 90, over 90 different languages, uh, whether it's a parent, grandparent, neighbor, or even a physician. Anyone who is involved in the care of a child uh, may call Niagara Parents for support. So some of the uh, topics that we provide support for are becoming a parent, positive parenting strategies, infant sleep and feeding support, as well as breastfeeding and lactation guidance. We can also triage uh, callers to the dental health program, as well as other uh, programming here within uh, Niagara Region Public Health, such as the uh, Vaccine Preventable Disease Department, uh, in case there's any questions about uh, child vaccination. Some of the uh, programs that we offer here as well uh, include the home visiting program. Uh, so nurse family partnership, for example, is an evidence based program uh, that provides one on one home visit and supports uh, for young moms from pregnancy to age two. The infant and child development services uh, by appointment, clients can access uh, a ICDS consultant who is trained to identify developmental risk from birth to age two. We also have our Healthy Babies, Healthy Children uh, program where we screen uh, new parents in hospital uh, and provide postpartum follow up by phone, home visit uh, from pregnancy until a child transitions to school. And of course, our cognitive behavioral therapy for postpartum depression um, program. So this is for new and pregnant parents with babies up to 18 months of age that report feeling depressed, sad, or anxious. Uh, nurses are equipped with diagnostic and screening tools for anxiety, depression, as well as borderline personality disorder, although that one is not as common. And mental health assessments completed by Niagara parents may be faxed uh, back to the family physician uh, when consent is provided by uh, the, the client or patient. Next slide. Uh, but I also wanted to uh, circle back to um, your roles as healthcare providers. We actually have a online referral form. You can also uh, download a fax version of this form. And if you have any uh, concerns about the client and believe that they would benefit from any sort of follow up, or if you uh, have suspicion that maybe they are uh, presenting symptoms of depression, uh, but didn't have time to do an assessment. Um, as I mentioned, we are capable of doing those assessments and we also have access to other community uh, uh, resources that we can direct clients to. Um, so by accessing this online referral form, a physician may uh, make a request for Niagara parents to reach out to a client and we can do follow up. And um, as I previously mentioned, we can send any results of screening uh, back to the family physician. And with that being said, um, you know, yeah, this is just a still image of uh, the family health referral form, uh, just so that you can familiarize yourself with it. But uh, that was just my brief overview of some of the programs here um, that we support through Niagara Region Public Health. Uh, of course, when in doubt, if you ever uh, believe that a parent may benefit uh, or require further support, Niagara Parents is a, is a great resource to direct clients to. 
And with that being said, I will open it up to uh, questions and answers. If you have any questions for our keynote speakers, please submit them. And just as the main chat has stated here, uh, please provide those questions in the Q&A section of Microsoft Teams. I'm not seeing uh, questions um, being prompted at this moment, so I am going to ask some of the questions that were submitted to us during registration. One of the questions um, was how uh, how do we um, tackle facts or um, children's services involvement uh, as a barrier uh, to seeking uh, and staying in care? Um, so I, I believe the context was that uh, oftentimes a lot of the parents um, have ACEs themselves and are concerned that their their behavior uh, may result in uh, facts involvement. I'm not sure if uh, our keynote speakers can answer that question there. If they have any thoughts on that. So Eric, what, what's the question? Sorry, that. So um, it was uh, how do we address uh, parents that have a concern that their mental health uh, will be uh, a, a reason for a, uh, family oh, and children's services or uh, children's services uh, involvement. I see. So years ago, I was on of the volunteer board of so I'm a psychiatrist. I work with uh, women, pregnant people, birthing parents. Um, and uh, years ago, I joined the volunteer board of directors of the um, Children's Aid Society in the community in which I live to try to better understand, you know, sort of both sides of this argument, because I spent a lot of my career trying to, you know, sort of help people with mental health problems. And one of the things that I found is that the, you know, um, these these organizations, FACS and, and the CAS, uh, they have so, they have so many children. They are not looking necessarily to apprehend children. And I know that whenever I interact with them, you know, it is seen as a positive that people have sought treatment and are receiving treatment for a for a mental disorder. And so um, I don't know that it necessarily uh, I don't know that those are in and of themselves used uh, necessarily always against the client. There may be other things that um, but uh, but I think when when they do get into care and are coming regularly and, and compliant with treatment and are uh, doing the things to, to help their mental health, it, it often is is very help. It can my experience has been very helpful for them rather than a detriment. Thank you. Uh, another question that we received during registration was, um, do you have any comments on uh, cultural sensitivity um, when it comes to maternal mental health and uh, perhaps discussing mental health, um, perhaps to someone who's not as familiar with mental health and um, May, may need further explanation or support. Mm. Um, you know, the, the the cultural sensitivity is obviously going to be very important in 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 any kind of mental uh, health field. Um, we you know, the the difficulty in perinatal mental health is that we we, we barely have a functioning system. Um, and so, you know, we don't, you know, Niagara is one of a few public health units that actually has like a, a like treatment groups or, or treatment options and things like that. And so, you know, I think the big problem is that we just don't have enough services, period. Um, you know, I know that the, the, the public health units that I've worked with are always trying to find ways to make their services as, as culturally sensitive as possible. Um, it's in a country like Canada when there are so many different groups, it, it can be a challenge. Um, so I don't know, I don't know if I have the solution. I mean, cultural adaptations of these different psychotherapies uh, can be helpful. 
Um, but it's hard in any one like public health unit or region in Canada, unless you're in like Toronto or Montreal, Montreal or, or Vancouver or something to, to, to have large numbers of individuals that belong to any one group to sort of really benefit from that. You know, in terms of, I mean, there are so many different individuals from so many different cultures that I've worked with over the years, and I don't know that I have the, the key to, 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 to helping them. Um, they've, they, I have always demonstrated an openness to learning from them. I don't know all of the different cultures, um, and I don't know all of their traditions, but I, I do let them know that there are two sets of experts in the room when I see a patient. Um, I would be an expert at, at sort of the medical and psychiatric things, and they're experts at themselves, their lives, their culture, their spirituality, and and I always want to. I'm always excited about learning from them because I get to learn something new, and if I can use that to. Um, if I can use that to try to enhance their care, I do. But I don't know if that sounds sort of like privileged and hokey, but that's that's the best that I've done um, because I, 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 I yeah, that, that's sort of what I've said, yeah. Thank you. Another question um, in polling is um, how, how can we address uh, mental health needs uh, given that oftentimes um, there's there's not enough time or um, there's there's perhaps other competing demands um, specifically uh, oftentimes the conversation may shift towards the child and um, and move away from addressing maternal mental health yeah it's so hard I mean I don't I don't envy envy my friends and family medicine and, and primary care nurse practitioners and things like that it is it is so difficult to sort of you know, triage these things and figure out what the, because there's so, there can be so many pressing issues and not enough time. Um, there was a book written years ago uh, called the 15 minute, 15 minute hour. And they, they often use something called the bathes method um, where it's an acronym for, you know, asking about, you know, the background of the problem, how the person's feeling about it, what's troubling the most about it, how they're handling it and then empathizing. So that bathes acronym um, it can be a really nice way to, um, if you've decided that a, a, a parent has a mental health problem, to sort of try to understand it and empathize with them. So the bathes method, I, I really uh, like like it. Um, so that that's one way to try to just, you know, and and just trying to and just listening because you know when people come, sometimes they want you to fix their problems and sometimes they don't want you to fix their problems, but they always want to be, they always want you to listen. And so I think this bathes method is a nice way to sort of a nice like acronym by which you can remember ways of sort of like learning about the person, but also empathizing with their situation and allowing it to be therapeutic, even if you don't have an hour to do it in. Thank you. I don't think I see any questions in the chat, but I'll continue drawing from questions uh, that we received. Now, there's a question here that says, uh, if patient has postpartum depression, can prophylactic medication um, be prescribed? Perhaps this may be indicating towards a previous uh, yeah. pregnancy yeah. with postpartum depression. So I think the question might be, as a prophylactic, can we yeah. prescribe this? There, there are two... I think there were two trials uh, looking at uh, prophylactic antidepressants on people who had had um, a previous postpartum major depressive episode. And um, they're very small trials. So there's very little, very little evidence on this. But the trial that was done, the trial that was effective used, uh, used sertraline, uh, Zoloft, um, and started uh, sertraline the first day postpartum in half of the half of the sample that had developed previous postpartum depression, and the other half of the sample didn't get sertraline. It was a study done in the U.S. Um, and they found that 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 it, it significant it, it sort of like reduced the risk of developing postpartum depression by by three times. So, you know that that's what that study showed. I mean, in practice, um, if I have a patient like this, I rather than prophylactically treat them, um, which is one option that this study suggested, sometimes I, uh, I'll i just follow them closely uh, if I can and keep an eye out to see if the symptoms are developing rather than uh, prophylactically treating something. Because if you do prophylactically treat, you don't know whether it was going to be depression or not, and then they're on that antidepressant, so you don't know when to stop it. So I, if you have the capacity to follow people closely and, and they're good about following up, I sometimes just monitor closely rather than prophylaxing. But if it's someone who has limited access or 
you know, struggles to attend appointments and it's hard to follow them or you don't have the capacity to follow them as closely, then using medicines uh, to reduce the risk could help based on some very, very small trials. Okay, next question. Are there clear similarities and differences in symptom presentation of poor neonatal adaptation syndrome and neonatal abstinence syndrome? Well, I, I'm I'm not a neonatologist or a pediatrician, so I, I don't see, I, I actually don't end up seeing um, uh, the abstinence syndrome <clears throat> associated with the other uh, medicines. I think that there are some some superficial similarities, some some similarities between the terms in terms of the, the physical manifestations. Um, but I don't know. I don't know the the sort of like opioid and other uh, abstinence syndromes well, so I, I I can't very intelligently comment on that. So I'm sorry. <clears throat> Thank you. And I just want to bring up a comment uh, by Allison. Uh, she said that the information provided about the medication was extremely helpful, and quite a few of our questions that we received during registration uh, were about prescribing practices and medication. So uh, that is very appreciated. Yeah, thanks very much, Allison. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay. Okay. I'm not seeing any further questions. So I think with that being said, uh, we will conclude the session for today. I just want to thank uh, everyone in attendance. I want to thank our keynote speakers, uh, Dr. Ryan Van Lieshout and Dr. Kraskowski, uh, Dr. Kazmani as well. Thank you so much uh, for your attendance and for your contributions to today's conversation.